these days, uh, it sometimes feels a bit weird being a Ruby programmer. I mean, we're here, we got lots of people here, but once you go out there into the internet to Hacker News, Reddit, and whatnot, it looks like all these people, they have these cool new toys that everyone is playing with, you know? Everybody's doing Elixir, Elm, functional programming, hardcore machine learning, something Go, Rust, or whatever. And everybody's doing that, and you look at them like, I, I want to have these toys too, you know? And then you go there and like, I, I want to have these toys too, I want to play with you. And then they go like, oh God, you're Ruby developers, ah! You're like from the last century, where did you come from? Why are you still here? Shouldn't you do something new, something innovative? What are you doing with your life? And you're like, ah, oh, well, you know, actually Ruby is really nice and stuff, you know? It's, it's cool, I like it. And they're, they're like, nah, you, you know, you don't even have a type system, you can't do parallel execution, no performance, what's up with you? So, as a result, oftentimes it feels, sometimes as you're all alone, I mean, obviously, it doesn't feel like this right here, because right now we have lots of uh, really nice and friendly Ruby friends around us, but uh, sometimes out there it can feel like it, like we don't, we're not hip anymore, you know? We have to acknowledge that. We're not a hip new cool thing that everybody learns anymore. We're the establishment that has its upsides and has its downsides. So, within these discussions, often a question pops up. Is Ruby dying? Or more often it's even a statement. Ruby is dying. You should learn something different. Like, often um, people come to me and are like, oh, so do you think it's still worth learning Ruby, you know? Shouldn't I be learning Elixir or Go or something, you know? It's that, does Ruby still cut it? And Obviously, my point is, yes, of course, you should still learn Ruby. It has a great ecosystem. It's great for all of you, but people don't see it that way. And it also, I think a lot of it seems that way because there have been people that were early adopters of Ruby have been with us for five, ten years or longer, and now they start looking at other stuff. Um, they're becoming polygod. They're doing something in Elixir, which is, you know, which is fine. But it seems like to many in the community, those people are all leaving, like we should leave the sinking ship. Um, I obviously don't think that that's the truth, but I ask myself, if they are not here anymore, where do they go? And so in short, where do Rubyists go? And this is my talk, my name is Toby, and I'm sorry for the projectors, I hope it's still somewhat readable. Um, you can find me as at Practop on Twitter, GitHub and whatever, and I'm mainly a Ruby programmer, but I also do JavaScript, I do very good amount of Elixir, specifically with Benchy and benchmarking. I run the Ruby user group in Berlin, and I am the tech lead at Leafery, which is a same-day delivery company based in Berlin, which is where I'm from. So I wanted to answer this question, like, where do Rubyists go? And do people actually still like Ruby, or do they hate it, or whatever, what's up? So I made a questionnaire. Uh, I made it last November, and this is part of the questionnaire. And it has questions like, when did you start learning programming? And specifically also, which programming, programming languages did you start learning after you have already learned Ruby to see like, where do they go? Or what are they interested in at the very least? I got 673 responses, which is quite good, quite nice. So let's have a bit of a look at uh, some of the results I got. So this is, uh, when did they start learning programming, not Ruby? And we can see we have sort of like a big boost around the year 2000, and then it goes all the way back to the 1980s where I wasn't even born and people have been programming since then, so there's like some old wise wizards in there. And of course, like the newer ones aren't as much because, you know, if you just started learning programming, you probably wouldn't click on a survey that says, where do Rubyists go? You probably wouldn't. Um, next up, uh, when did you start learning Ruby? Um, and that is very interesting uh, from my point of view is we had some that started before Rails because Rails came out as a first version in 2004 and that's where you can see like Ruby was a very minor language at the time. Not many people knew or did Ruby. Uh, but then we have the first uh, bump and then with the first major release with Rails 1.0 we go woo! So, Basically, all Ruby programmers are just here because of Rails. You can think of Rails whatever you want, but uh, without Rails, we wouldn't be here because probably Ruby wouldn't have picked up. I would hope, I would hope that Ruby would have picked up before, but it didn't. Or maybe it would have later. We'll see. 
So what's so special about Rails? I also asked people, why uh, did you start learning Ruby? What was your reason? I had written half of Rails in PHP. Then Rails was announced, and it was like a sheet code to a working framework. I love that quote uh, so much because it sort of encapsulates uh, what the state of development uh, was like at the time. So, um, other interesting points uh, for me in this graph. So we can see there was a big bump where it seemed like uh, Rails and Ruby were going downhill, but then in 2010, it went up again. Uh, that might be a statistic anomaly, but here it went up again. And for me, that's the first Rails Gods workshop. That might be total uh, coincidence, but uh, for me, it's part of that. And you see the next bump, that might be more personally related. That's the first Rails Gods Berlin workshop. Uh, <laughs> And that might be my personal network because, like, so the Rails Gods community in Berlin was amazing. We did workshops almost like every two months, and I was at almost every one of them. So I know a lot of people uh, from there, and a lot of people got into the community and might have answered the survey. So that's a bit of bias that the survey has through that I proposed the survey or that I put the survey online. So let's talk for a moment about surveys and bias. I have a big amount of people, a big population, 673, that's quite good. But still, the answers that I have here, they're not final. You know, they're all influenced by me and by where I posted the survey. So it's basically a selection bias. Who actually answers the survey? I'm also like, very active in the Elixir community. So of course, Elixir will have a good result because my Elixir friends uh, will answer the survey. And also, Elixir conferences are full of Ruby people. So it might not be bad, but I don't know. Uh, same thing with all the Rates God stuff. And moreover, like, where did I post the survey? I posted it on the Ruby Reddit. I posted it on Lobsters, which we'll see in a second. But I didn't go to each and every language sub-community and posted it there. So in order to find the survey, you would still have to be somewhat interested in Ruby in general uh, to find it. So people that probably super hate Ruby wouldn't have seen it. Speaking of Lobsters, uh, who here knows Lobsters? Almost no one. Well, um, it is a um, invite or like recommendation uh, only community that's sort of like hacker news, but without all the startup bullshit and more computer science, more or less. And there, my post was on the front page for over a day. And why do I pick out this specific example? Um, you can't read it, but I highlighted on the screenshot. I highlighted every programming language that was not my blog post. Uh, my survey that was mentioned, and it's two times Haskell and one time Rust. So there's another bias in there. So they're very big on Haskell and Rust. Putting all of that aside, I wanted to ask the question, is Ruby dying? And I thought the best way to answer the question is to ask people, would you still like to be doing Ruby in five years? And uh, as you can see, all the way to the left, it's would hate it, and to the right, we go to uh, I would love it. And so it's an overwhelmingly positive response. And to be honest, I still love Ruby, but I wouldn't have expected that positive response. I would have expected that it sort of went to free, where people would be like, you know, I do Ruby, but I don't love it, I don't hate it, you know, I could still do it in five years, whatever. But the majority of people had a positive reaction to the question, which was really interesting. Um, so, yeah, people still love Ruby. Now. I said I wanted to look at the languages, and I also wanted to look at why people go to these languages. So I also asked them, why did you learn these languages, and what languages did you learn? And so let's have a look at what languages people did learn. Um, the graphs are divided in orange, which is uh, I learned it for my workplace, and green, I learned it for my free time, or like out of my own initiative, basically. And probably most of you can't read it, but the order goes, First, JavaScript, then Elixir, Go, Python, Rust, Clojure, Java, Haskell, Crystal, Elm, Swift, C, Erlang, Scala, and Objective-C. So, what can we see here? Of course, almost everyone or most of the people learn JavaScript at some point. Uh, you can also see that sort of 50-50 between work time and free time, which, I mean, today, if you're a web developer, you sort of have to touch JavaScript for all those fancy interactive features. Um, it's basically a requirement right now. Elixir is pretty big, and in the free time uh, category, is even ahead of JavaScript. 
uh, which is uh, quite nice, but also might be the bias. But really, if I ask at Elixir conferences how many people are or used to be uh, Ruby developers, it's 70 or 80 percent. So it's, <laughs> it's a huge market for Elixir. Then comes Python, which has a strong showing, but like a surprisingly big portion of for work, which I think is also because of the data science and machine learning, because all the companies do it right now, and Python is the tool for the job, because it has all the best libraries um, out there from Google. Then, oh, I just skipped over Go, I'm sorry. Uh, Go is also pre whoops, pretty big. And what's interesting, so there's sort of a rivalry between Go and Rust, and... If we look at free time, Go and Rust have almost the same, they're on the same level, but Go is apparently used much more in the workplace so far. So there's a couple of other interesting observations, such as Java's almost exclusively work time. Um, and I wanted to look at these languages, and I selected these eight languages. So I, did, I selected JavaScript, Elixir, Go, Rust, Clojure, Haskell, and Crystal to have a look at them and share what I found uh, with you here today. Um, there's a couple of obvious omissions. I left out Python, not because I don't like Python. Python is a great language, but some people might uh, throw stones at me for this, but Python and Ruby are essentially the same. They're, they're dynamic object-oriented scripting languages. They're essentially the same. There's nothing interesting. No, nobody of them can do parallelism. So they're very, very similar in terms of what they can do. The only biggest difference is their main use case. Ruby is more in the web uh, with Rails and web frameworks, while as Python has the whole uh, machine learning, uh, mathematical computation space for it, and it's used at Google, obviously. Java I excluded because people learn it in their work time for Java. So. No, <laughs> and Elm didn't make the cut quite, so uh, Crystal bet Elm by an inch, which is happy for me because I like Crystal very much, and who here has heard of Crystal? Okay, I would say about 50% of the people, and for the other 50% of the people, I'm happy to introduce this language to you. So a little disclaimer before we go on. I'm obviously not an expert in all of these languages. I'm not super hooper 100x developer. That's not me. I've written production systems in, I think, four of them. I've casually enjoyed some of them, but some of them I just looked at for the purpose of this talk. But every time I did that, I have a friend who does this language, and then I just asked him, you know, please double check what I say about this language. Pretty please, thank you. So let's have a little meet and greet with those languages. And for a little meet and greet, it's nice to know when were those languages born. So let's have a look at it. Um, the earliest one is Haskell, uh, which was first. So the dates here are first uh, official public release. Um, Haskell 1990, so it's our oldest contender, let's say. Ruby, first public release in 1995, so we always compare them against Ruby. Um, and then JavaScript and the web was also 1995. And then for a long time, nothing. Um, I think part of it is a recency bias. Uh, people want to learn new cool things. The other part of it is that you know our computers moved on um, so, such that parallelism is much, much more important now. We can't just uh, tune the single-threaded performance up anymore. That's not possible anymore. So we needed new concepts, and with new concepts, also new languages emerged. So Clojure 2007. The other JavaScript here is Node.js, which the first public release was 2009, same year as Go. One year afterwards, Rust, which is also a bit where this Go versus Rust uh, rivalry, especially in the beginning, came from, also in Mozilla versus Google. Pick your, pick your side. And then Elixir 2011. And Crystal is very, very young, well, language-wise. Uh, Crystal is, uh, was first publicly released in 2014. So, how do I best show off all these languages in what little time I have? I think the organizers are already nervous that I'll also go over time, but I'll, I'll try to keep it uh, short. Fizzbuzz. Who here knows Fizzbuzz? Not so many. I am surprised. Or oh, you are all asleep and I'm doing a terrible job. Okay. Let's explain Fizzbuzz to you. It's a very simple programming problem that in a blog post, somebody said that still 70% or something of applicants couldn't solve. So what is Fizzbuzz? you're supposed to print out the numbers from 1 to 100, but with the following rules. So first you print out 1, you print out 2, that's fine. And then when you reach some, a number that's divisible by 3, you should print out fizz. And if you reach a number that's divisible by 5, you print out buzz. And now you can go on. So 3 is fizz, 5 is buzz, 
6 is fizz again, and that can go on. But if you reach a number that's divisible by both um, 3 and 5, then you print fizz bars. That's, that's the entire thing. It's pretty simple. I hope uh, we can agree. And so I will show you a FizzBoss implementation in each of the languages. And because Ruby is a Ruby conference, we we'll start with Ruby. This is my FizzBoss implementation in Ruby. And so I try to keep all of them in sort of the same pattern. Uh, namely, I have up here, I have a method that for a given number n um, calculates the FizzBoss value of it. And then I have a main loop that prints out um, all those. So I have an input-output um, separation, which we learned before in the talk by Ivan. Um, and I have that for all of those. And so what do I do? Um, first, modulo. Modulo gives you, it does a division, and it tells you what the remainder is. And if the remainder of a division is 0, then it is divisible by that number. You will also note that I say divisible by 15, not by 3 and 5, and that's just a law of math that I have applied here. So we first check, is it divisible by 15, then fist bus, by 5 bus, by 3 fists, otherwise just return the number. So that's it. Ruby solution clear? Cool. Um, so now let's have a look at the crystal solution. <laughs> So that is uh, CP FISBOS RB to uh, FISBOS CR. And I promise you I didn't point into it. I, I wrote this solution um, for myself. I, let, I think I let Rubicop uh, run against it. Not quite sure. And then I just copied over to see if it would work. So with that, you already see what kind of language um, Crystal is. Crystal has the tagline of fast as C, slick as Ruby. And it started sort of as a project for more of a compiled Ruby, but they realized they needed to make some changes to it. So Crystal, among other things, is, so it's a compiled language compared to LLVM bytecode. It's very, very fast. It has type inference, but like it has a type system, which is also pretty cool if you ask me. And, but you only need to specify the types for instance variables. And because there's no instance variable here, we don't need to specify the types. It's, it's super fast. There's already web frameworks out there for it. It's, it's a great language to take a look at. Um, yep. So next language, Elixir. So what can we see with Elixir? So first, we see that I implemented the same method over and over. So there's four implementations of FISPA. So finally, we have method overloading again, which I don't know how, how much I missed it until I rediscovered method overloading in uh, Crystal. And what we do here, we use guard statements. So I say, only when the reminder of 9 and 15, so modulo equals 0, then execute this body. So I basically took the if-else and put it into the guard statements of the functions. I don't always write the simplest solution for this, because sometimes I just want to show off some features of the language for you. Um, I can show off pattern matching, but I, don't, and I also don't have time to explain pattern matching to you, but pattern matching is one of the most brain-changing things that I've learned while doing Elixir, or that I really, really want to have in Ruby. So if you're interested, please look that up. Um, another thing that Elixir is famous for is the pipes, which uh, if you come from Clojure, it's sort of the threading needle operator, which means here I take i, and i is passed into the first argument to fizzbus fizzbus, and then whatever the return value of that is, it's put into io puts. So it's basically, a f it shows very nicely the flow of transformation of functional programming. So I have a value, and I apply some transformations to it, and then I have my end result. That is uh, what the pipe operator helps you with. If I didn't use the pipe operator, I would read it from the inside out. So I say i, and then I do fizzbus, fizzbus, and then I do i outputs, which is very hard to read, especially if you have like six transformations and not just two, like here. So next language, Haskell. That is. Uh, Personally, I would say surprisingly nice. Haskell is a language I haven't played with uh, before so much. But I really like myself. It has the same guard statements as uh, we've seen with Alex here. It looks a bit different, but it's like one clause. And if x modulo, fif x modulo 15 equals 0, do fizzbus, and so on and so on. The else is otherwise, and then we just return the value. That's fine. But something here looks very weird, at least for me, which is up here, map capital M underscore, like, 
what the hell is that? You know, what, what does this even mean? And it is a map monadic action because Haskell is a very pure functional programming language and things like output that's evil, you shouldn't do that, and that's so it's wrapped in a monad. And so because we do output with put strun there, um, it is a monadic action. And the underscore just means don't build up the result because normally with a map we would uh, gather uh, the results, but here we don't need them, so we, so we say don't do that. I'll, tell, I'll say to all of you, please learn functional programming and some from another. It really helps your Ruby code, but don't take the naming conventions. Stick to the Ruby naming conventions. <laughs> another thing that I noticed in the Haskell example is there's not a single type annotation here. Haskell is famous for its typing system. It's one of the best typing systems. I was like, why is there no type annotation here? And that's also because um, Haskell has type inference. From this, it can guess or it can know the types well enough itself so that we don't need to give it type annotations. Of course, real Haskell programs would have type annotations, but I found it quite nice and interesting. I always thought I would, learn, I would have to learn category, category theory before I learn Haskell, but gladly I don't have to. Go. Go is the reason why the font size is as it is, because otherwise the Go solution wouldn't fit on the slide. It is the longest solution. Um, and yeah, I mean, it works. It is rather simple. Um, nothing too special here. A couple of funny side notes is that if you name a function with a capital case, uh, it starts with a capital case letter, then it's a public function, which is sort of odd, but their language is cool. Um, you see it has types. And what I also find kind of weird is that the type is after the actual variable name, which is a bit also weird for me, but what do you know? And also these names like FMT, strconf, it's again, please don't take the naming conventions. Um, other things that I couldn't fit in here, but which Go is sort of famous for, um, it has no generics and no exceptions. So every time a, a function call might fail, you get two values back, like the return value and like a potential error value that you then always have to check, was this an error, yes or no, which is one of the biggest uh, criticisms against Go. Rust, on the other hand, um, I really, really like the solution. And when you look at the Rust solution, you have to keep in mind, Rust is a systems programming language at its heart. So if we take languages on like the level of abstraction, Rust is on the lowest level. You know, you can deal with like the heap, the stack that's all in there, but this doesn't look like a low level language solution. This doesn't look like C or something. This looks like a very, very high level language. And part of that is Rust's zero cost abstractions, um, they call it. So they make these nice abstractions, but they still perform at full speed, which is just great. I mean, we have a nice little for each loop there and personal favorite again, we even have pattern matching. We have a match operator and here it's kind of different. So we match against the result of n module three and n module five. And then we just check, okay, if both are divisible, then fist bus. Otherwise, um, we go if the first one and so on and so on. It's, it's great. Um, that was very impressive to me. So personally, Rust is one of the languages I don't know about that I really want to learn. Why do I, ah, yep. Also type annotations, of course. But so why do I really want to learn Rust? Partly because of this. Um, <laughs> so you can see that all of them have like a two string afterwards, after, after the real string. You were like, why is that? Why, why do you need to do that? That looks stupid. Um, and the problem is, and now I am now it gets into the muddy territory where I'm not 100% sure what I'm talking about, but I try my best. Um, Rust um, to give the guarantees that Rust gives, we need a concept of ownership of uh, certain things, and then you also need to know are the heap or stack allocated or whatever. And because I would want it to return two things, once a, like a literal string that is allocated uh, somewhere, and then a number that is dynamically converted to a string that's actually a different return type. So I can't do that. Um, so yeah, it's because of safety. And now all of these are heap allocated. And I asked my Rust friend, I was like, Florian, like what, what, what is wrong, right? what do I need to do? He says like, you know, for a simple solution, this is fine. I could use cowlip that manages the borrowing, but that, would be out of my scope, I was like, okay, no. And he also told me that there is a real uh, solution, which is, you know, we're not using these as strings, we're using these as values that stand for something. So we could 
create a new type where all the values that we're about to use are in there and that know how to be transferred to, uh, transformed to a string. However, that solution would have been by far the longest one, but if you get this, uh, the slides, the real solution thing is a link. It's kind of interesting. It's actually a very nice and clean solution. I just didn't have the space for it. So, JavaScript. JavaScript has gotten increasingly nicer over time. For instance, we have fancy cool new stuff like these arrow functions, but otherwise it's still good old JavaScript. We have a normal for loop. We return things. It's pretty much a very standard, non-special solution. But one thing to always watch out for in JavaScript is the little quirks. Um, technically, we wouldn't need the good old triple equals here, but just uh, to highlight and use good practices and pass uh, ESLint triple equals, no double equals, or you run into dangerous territory. So I think last but not least, uh, we have Clojure, which looks a lot different than the other programming languages, which is uh, because it's a Lisp on the JVM. Lisp is ages old, and there's the Lisp people are these people, like uh, before, I think Paulo said that, um, you know, finally, we realized that functional programming is great. Lisp people have been screaming that functional programming is great since the 1970s or even longer, you know? But Clojure is sort of the first Lisp that, from my understanding, got mainstream success. And how did they do that? They run on the JVM. Before, it was always there was lots of little lists, and so the ecosystem was uh, not that big. But if you are on the JVM, you can just use all of the Java libraries and be done with it. So that's great for them. Um, another funny thing that you that you notice, or why it looks so funny in general, is that the function calls are prefixed, not infix here. So it's not n modulo 15; it's modulo between n and 15, which is one of the big difference and. The obvious joke and difference is, of course, the parentheses um, that are over, but actually help you uh, keeping a good, uh, consistent code. So after this brief introduction, um, let's have a look at these languages. And I will have a look at them in terms of certain categories. And those were categories that came up in the survey of what people said they liked about the particular language that they learned or why they learned a particular language. So first of all, lots of people wanted to still have a Ruby-like syntax, uh, which I think most of us can agree with. And we can see that, of course, Ruby has a Ruby-like syntax, but also um, Chris and Alexey have very Ruby-like syntaxes, which, by the way, lots of people that come from other languages in the Alexey community don't really appreciate. Um, yeah, the other ones have all sort of their own syntax or more like C-like languages. So let's look at the paradigm of languages that people learn these days. Ruby is object-oriented, Crystal is object-oriented. But uh, beyond that, we have a lot of functional programming languages. So we have sort of uh, the triangle of functional programming languages over here, Elixir, Haskell, and Clojure. And the other ones are sort of mixed. So I would argue that modern JavaScript is or should be functional but also inherently it's uh, procedural, but especially if you do React and Immutable JS, you're very close to that functional mindset. Uh, Rust is sort of first procedural, then functional, and Go is like a complete just um, procedural um, program language, which is interesting to me that we have these procedural languages now, because back then everybody was high on OO and was like object-oriented programming, best thing ever, and like let's leave the old procedural stuff behind, and now there's like a revival of that. We're going back to that a bit, because like the only new language here is Crystal, and Crystal is very much alike to Ruby, which is why it is um, object-oriented. One of the biggest concerns of people was uh, parallelism. And before I talk about parallelism, I have to make something clear, because actually most people wrote concurrency. And there's a difference between concurrency and parallelism, and Ruby is concurrent, but it's not parallel. The difference is, right now I'm doing lots of things. I'm talking, I'm making gestures, I'm breathing, I'm doing all of that. That is parallel. I do lots of things really at the same time. Concurrency, in the, on the other hand, is different. I can only do one thing at a time. I hope you get it. So in, <laughs> in concurrency, so in Ruby, only one piece of Ruby code in one uh, Ruby VM and one C Ruby VM can execute at a time. No two pieces of Ruby code can, which is concurrency. I can do multiple things, but I can't do them at once. Whereas in parallelism, I can do them at really the same time. So 
If we take a look at that, it's also very, very clear uh, that almost all the new languages have some sort of parallelism into them. And for Ruby, I have to say so, I always took what applies for C Ruby. And as you learned yesterday from Charlie, uh, JRuby has full parallelism and bulletproof, very, very good parallelism. So if you want some parallelism, go to JRuby. Uh, or also Rubinius, but maybe, well, topic for a different day. <laughs> um, yeah, Crystal sadly still has no real parallelism. They're still promising something and working on it, and that's actually what's uh, sort of delaying the 1.0 release. Because I think today you can't release a language without good higher level parallelism structures. It's just, it would, it would be idiotic. So let's hope uh, they still get something in there. Elixir and the underlying Erlang system is famous for the parallelism and especially for the actor system. So right now in Stockholm, Code Beam is happening and apparently someone from Cisco gave a talk and they said that around 90% of the internet traffic goes through some sort of Erlang system because Erlang is really huge in the space and also especially at Cisco. So it's really highly parallel fault tolerant systems and Elixir just builds on that uh, VM. Haskell has parallelism, but it's sort of weird. You have to compile it in a special way, and then you have MVAR, PARS. It's cool. Um, Go is famous for Go routines and channels, which is sort of like a multi-channel actor system, uh, you can say really short. For Rust, my advisor said I should say it's agnostic. You can do anything with it, but there's uh, implementations of, for instance, channel in the standard library. JavaScript is divided here because in the browser, yes, we have parallelism, we have web workers, we have service workers, we can't access the DOM, but we can run multiple uh, pieces of code at the same time. That's great, uh, but Node.js, not so much. Um, Clojure was famous for the software transaction memory, uh, but now they're more into transducers, PMAP, and all that stuff. Performance was also a huge reason why people wanted to learn new languages. And although I'm very big on benchmarks, if you know me, um, I didn't want to benchmark all of, these languages, uh, all of these languages. I can just tell you that each and every one of them is faster than C Ruby. You know, like if we go to JRuby and Truffle Ruby, that's different. But uh, just uh, out of my own interest, who here has ever deployed sort of an application in Ruby or put it to, per, to customers that was not C Ruby? That's like, I see two, three, four, yeah, sad. So go learn about JRuby. <laughs> um, type system was also a big uh, topic that people wanted to have addressed. And if we have another look at it, all of these languages have some form of type system or another. Ruby's the only one that's just, you know, a dynamic programming language. Um, Crystal is statically typed and there's a difference between inferred plus plus and inferred. So if you see before, like uh, Crystal and Haskell are completely statically typed, but you didn't see any uh, type annotations in my example because it can take that and it can figure out the types on itself. Sometimes it needs some leaf node to catch it, but uh, you need to just specify some types, not all of the types. Whereas for instance, Go and Rust, Yes, they have type inference, but still every method, every function needs to have the type parameters. The type inference there is just like if you say like, okay, let this variable be five, then it goes like, oh, five, that's an integer. So I'm an integer, okay. So it's not a very good type inference. So that's why I want to make a difference here. And the ones that have two colors are optional, are optionally typed. So Elixir has a typing system that they're also working to improve, but you need to run another tool to use it. Um, Clojure has something in its, in its standard library to do that. And for JavaScript, you have flow for typing, or you can just go all TypeScript. Oh, that's something I forgot to say in the beginning. JavaScript here includes all JavaScript dialects. Sorry, forgot that in the beginning. So it includes, um, oh, well, JavaScript dialects, CoffeeScript, TypeScript, so sort of languages that are compiled to JavaScript that don't come directly from another language. So Elm was its own thing, and also ClojureScript is its own thing. But the other more closer ones, I just through all in a big JavaScript bucket. Um, another thing that people said uh, was important to them was the distinction between compiled and interpreted code. And we can see almost everyone is compiled these days, except for Ruby and JavaScript. Another thing that is very related to that that I have to say no one brought up, 
but it's very important to me, so I'm going to share with you, is uh, self-hosted languages. That means languages that are implemented in themselves. And I always say that as, please show me your code, I want to see your code, which for me is very, very powerful. Um, so we can see here, those are the languages that are implemented in themselves, and why do I say it's very powerful? I can look and see what the actual language creators, how they think code in their language should be written. I can go in there and fix bugs very easily. I'm not qualified to figure out C Ruby code and fix it. I, I shouldn't do that. Somebody should pull me away if I attempt to do it. But I can fix bugs in Elixir. I can write. So in, when I started with Chris, it was pretty fresh. Innumerable wasn't complete. So I just implemented all of the rest of Innumerable because I love Innumerable. It's a favorite thing. It's the best thing about Ruby. And that's great. And when I was done with that, I started implementing Enumerator because that's also great. And then you get code reviews from the people that made the language. So you learn so much. It's just such a big thing for me. And especially in Elixir, we have doc tests. I can go in there, write doc tests, and fix stuff. Amazing. Um, single file distribution, which means that if I want to deploy the application, I can, I can get one file, push it to some server, and then be done with it. Um, and don't have to have anything installed on there. And who can do that? Most people can do that. I mean, Clojure can do it if you have a JVM, but the JVM is technically dependent, so no. Um, but yeah, everybody else uh, can do that. Garbage collection is another big thing. And of course, almost all of these languages are garbage collected. Just Rust isn't. But Rust, as I said, is still memory safe through all its borrowing mechanics. And that's one of the best things you can learn when you learn Rust, I believe. I haven't learned it yet to a good enough extent. Um, so yeah. But what does that mean now? What, like I told you all these things, but what does it mean? Um, I think the major points, the points that came up most often are we want parallelism, we want typing, and we want performance. Those were the three main things that came up. So, but what can we do with all that information? First, I would encourage you all to learn a new programming language this year. It expands your mind. One of the best things that I ever did for my Ruby code was read a book called Functional Programming Patterns in Closure and Scala. It made my Ruby code so much better just to have that thinking, have these additional tool sets, because Ruby can also do functional. These, by the way, are always quotes from answers from the survey. Ruby's OO model was brain expanding, and I was seeking more brain expanding paradigms that would let me think entirely new thoughts. I love uh, the picture and beauty of that. Other people, you know, they just learn stuff for joy. They just said, like, I just want to see what that is. I just wanted to learn it for the joy of it, which is pretty fine. Of course, sometimes you learn new tools because you are in a new domain. Machine learning, gotta do Python. That's just what it is. But also, we should move away from that, like, I'm a Ruby developer. I'm a developer. I know these languages. I'm a Polyglot developer. I can choose the best tool for the job. And so just add new tools to your toolbox. Ruby can do parallelism, learn Elixir or something if you want to do um, some um, bigger data uh, transformations. So where does Ruby go? Rails is strangling Ruby. In the same way that you don't quit because of a bad company, you quit because of a bad boss, is what someone said. And I think a feeling that also in Ivan's talk uh, was shared. So, but then again, what does that mean for Ruby? Where, where is Ruby headed as a language? Remember these points, parallel typing fast. All of these are things that are in discussion for Ruby 3.0. We are talking about guilds, we're talking about an option type system, we have MJIT now to make Ruby faster. So all of them are in discussion. Should we adopt all of these? Ruby is the best language I have used over my 30 years programming. I hope Ruby 3 puts an end to the Ruby is slow meme once and for all. I really like Ruby for what it is. And don't think adding a type system or something is the best way to keep Ruby relevant. Don't morph Ruby into something it's not. The question is up there for the Ruby core team to decide what they want to do. But we're not stuck with Ruby. Ruby is still a good language. We can still learn many new languages. And please then always be aware, we are all great. We can all learn something from other languages, and it's always good to have them in your tool belt. So please go out there, um, explore some new lands, learn some new paradigms, get better at your Ruby coding through it, and have the right tools when you need them. So enjoy coding and learning in whatever language you like. Thank you.